plane crash carrying WSU football team. Do you feel a sensation of uh, losing altitude? I would not get my parents coming home. It was kind of overtaken by fear. Today is a tribute to lives lost. The pain and suffering that it caused. That's the crash that didn't have to happen. They were great people. They will always be great people. Cope with such a monumental tragedy. Can't be forgotten, and they never have forgotten it. You see how precious life is. Welcome to the home of the black and gold, a turf that's seen its share of injuries, wins, and losses. It's become a place of remembrance right here on the north side of Wichita State University. On its best day, fans would pack this stadium to cheer the Shockers on. But much of that changed on this day, a dramatic change on October 2nd, 1970. The team had packed up to face Utah State. They left this field here in Wichita being split into two planes, one nicknamed the Black Plane and the other the Gold Plane. The Black Plane headed on its planned course up north and landed safely in Logan, Utah. The pilot of the Gold Plane, however, just after refueling in Denver, made a last minute change. He wanted to give passengers a scenic view of the Rockies, a sight many had never seen up close before. For some, they would never see again. Cake Sports Director Chris Lilly takes us to that fateful day in the eyes of a man who survived it 50 years ago and why he's heading back. Walking through the wreckage of the Wichita State team plane, there's still a very real reminder of the loss and heartache decades after this tragedy. October 2nd, 1970 will be a day many in Kansas never forget. It's been 50 years since Rick Stevens played football in Cessna Stadium at Wichita State University. Being here, the memories come rushing back. Then the junior offensive lineman was full of promise and hope. But on October 2nd, 1970, that all changed. I looked out the window and all you could see was um, green trees, no blue sky. He was traveling on one of two team planes to Logan, Utah to play Utah State. He was the first passenger aboard his plane to notice things were going terribly wrong. Stevens went to the plane's cabin and he recalls seeing two panicked pilots. They had a topographical map out and were in somewhat of a state of urgent confusion. One of them remarked to the other, well, how high is that mountain there? How high is it there? And he said, 14,000 feet, we can't make that. He said something to the effect of, well, we should, have, we should have turned around, yeah, some time ago. Minutes later, the Martin 404 carrying Wichita State football coaches, starters, and boosters crashed, killing 31 people. Stevens was one of the eight players who survived. The next thing I remember is I am outside of the airplane uh, spitting out my teeth. Back home, former WSU player Paul Harrison learned the terrifying news about his close friends and cousin on board. I was just a total disbelief, um, panic. Stevens survived the impact, but a broken leg and dislocated hip left him unable to get away from the wreckage on his own. I, I was thrown out of the airplane to the front. People with injuries like his do die. Three nearby construction workers got to the accident before the rescue team. They found Stevens as the plane began to burn and carried him away to safety. And we stopped and as I looked, the fuselage was still intact pretty much. The wings were taken off, and that's when the plane exploded. Escaping death twice, Stevens says he couldn't process the tragedy taking place, but the acts of heroism from total strangers gave him a sense of relief. There were other people. Who cared enough to risk their lives, and they did. Stevens doesn't want Wichita State University to be defined by the plane crash, but he continues to share his story to honor the lives of the people who died 50 years ago. The world would have been a better place had this accident not happened. From Colorado, Chris Lilly, Cake News on your side. Thanks, Chris. Stevens and Harrison are lifelong friends, and this weekend they will go on a bicycle ride from Wichita 
all the way to the crash site in Colorado. Stevens has done this three times before, but he tells us this might be his last. Unfortunately, Wichita State was not the only team to face tragedy that year. About a month later, a jet carrying the Marshall University football team had crashed into a West Virginia hillside. It killed everyone on board. 75 people died, including football players, the school's athletic director, and team boosters, some of them who were rather prominent citizens. They had traveled to cheer on the thundering herd. The team was returning home from a game they were just two miles from the airport. Then in 1977, the University of Evansville also suffered a loss on a cold, rainy night in December. A flight takes off from an airport with the school's basketball team on board. 90 seconds later, it clips trees and crashed. It took the lives of all 29 people. After these schools' tragic losses, a move to make things safe. Next, I'll show you what changed within college sports, plus the blame game. We take you inside the federal investigation, hear testimony from the players themselves and the co-pilot who survived. Headlines from across the community with heartbreaking news. Officials and players perish. WSU mishap. Ill-fated airliner. A plane carrying Wichita State football players and staff crashing in a mountain west of Denver. The National Transportation Safety Board investigated the crash. Survivors gave their account of what they saw. There was a flash and it said plane crash carrying WSU football team in Colorado near Denver. And that was all it said. Well, like the newsroom stopped. From the moment the alert came out, the Cake News team sent Chief Photographer Larry Hatterberg and a reporter out to Colorado. They interviewed survivors alongside their hospital beds. And you had no warning from anyone on board that there was a problem? No, there was, you know, there was a dip in the plane kind of took our breath, but we, we didn't think anything of it, really. Nine people survived the crash. Eventually, the players heading back to Wichita, soon to testify in public hearings with the National Transportation Safety Board on what exactly happened inside that Martin 404. I noticed very specifically looking down to the ground below, the, watching the highway, and the, we could see the peaks. and. So we're towering above the aircraft. About the time he made a right turn, a quick right, and then and then back to the left. Uh, it began to look to me as if we were not going to be able to climb. The twin-engine aircraft was too low to pull out of the canyon or turn around. So above 10,000 feet, the plane started to clip trees and hit the mountainside. The NTSB believed many survived the initial impact of the crash, but because the plane refueled not long before, there was an explosion. Survivors were trapped inside the aircraft. The ruling? The plane was 5,000 pounds overweight, and there was poor judgment from the flight crew. This left Hatterberg in disbelief. And the pilots, they just, they made terrible decisions. Uh, that day. And as I say, that's the crash that didn't have to happen. This tragedy, along with other college sports plane crashes in the 70s, led to some big changes. The NCAA tells us this. After the Wichita State plane crash, the FAA outlined charter regulations for the entire NCAA membership. Following the tragic crash of a plane carrying the University of Evansville men's basketball team in 1977, the NCAA membership adopted legislation to allow schools to apply for a waiver to financial limits due to extraordinary personnel losses. There's been talks of bringing back Shocker football over the years, but one of the biggest hurdles is all of the money. It would take millions of dollars to renovate Cessna Stadium. This April, the Kansas Board of Regents gave WSU the green light to go ahead 
and tear everything down. Wichita State closed its football program in 1986. The stadium has been a fixture on campus for nearly 75 years. Eventually, a new, smaller, multi-purpose stadium will take its place. How the community came together in remarkable ways to support survivors. Memorial 70 continues. stations carrying the show coast to coast which was a fantastic mushrooming event we never anticipated and the kind of people we got to come here was uh, very very heartwarming. Let's make a deal's Monty Hall gearing up for the Night of the Stars benefit that November. Cake along with ABC stations across the country helped put together this mega fundraising event for the victims of the WSU and Marshall crashes. 7,500 people attended the event. It was filled with the talents of country music star Mac Davis, comedian George Goebel, singer Marilyn May, comedic duo Phil Ford and Mimi Hines, among so many others. There were many bright spots that emerged from the crash, but perhaps the most talked about to this day is how the players agreed that they would continue to play on the field. Just three weeks later, WSU geared up for what was dubbed its second season. A mostly rookie team headed down to Arkansas. It was a blowout. The Razorbacks plowed through the field for 62 points that went unanswered. But the former dean of student life, Jim Radigan, said the score did not matter. So this really wasn't a football game. It was an emotional experience all the way around. Then, in 2016, players from both teams reunited, back on the field where they played decades before, sharing memories and a brotherhood that means so much. We decided a long time ago we have to live for those players who had a short life. Some of the survivors tell me they feel very fortunate. They had something to return home to, fans, friends, and family. But for young children, in this case, 22 of them, they lost their parents. 13 of them orphaned. Really had the what they called shocker fever, gold fever yeah. in our house um, because the new stadium and the new field. That pride filled the home of football head coach Ben Wilson's. His daughter Elizabeth said the family moved to Wichita when he accepted the job in 1968. But a few games into his second season, a plane carrying his team had crashed, killing 31 on board. Just my mom and dad. She was just 10 when her life changed, so mementos like this are priceless. However, there is one thing she wished she remembered. I don't really, I don't remember their voices. Yeah. So to have, you know, those clips is really, <laughs> it's a big deal. Uh, I'd like to think that we're going to come out right up in there with the, with the best of the leaders in, in the conference. Uh, of course, only time is going to tell that story, and we have a long, hard, tough road. Listening to her dad speak so humbly is among her fond memories. But recently, at a memorial ceremony, she was surprised with another from a fellow coach, Dennis Patterson. A few years ago at a memorial service, he came up to me and he said, I don't know why I have this. Yeah. I don't know if it came off, and I just, but I've kept it all these years. And it was so touching. And then I was going through a box of stuff and I found the other one. You just don't know how you're going to get through the next day. And then suddenly it's 50 years later and it's like, wow, you know, I've done it. I've survived through, through it. But it's been a constant my whole life. Elizabeth feels very grateful, however, with all the things that have happened in her life. In fact, she moved to different places around the world, but now she calls Wichita home. For one young survivor though, the crash also significantly changed his life. He was hoping to help people. About halfway up, the, the elements of the crash really started to come into focus. Um, it went from the beautiful smells of a pine forest to burning timber burning jet fuel. A sight he remembers vividly decades later. John Putt was just 12 years old. The Boy Scout had joined the Alpine Rescue Team and was called to help save people on the mountain. He found so much debris. I didn't handle it well. Um, 
uh, when I made a few steps, picked up a wallet that had a uh, picture of a family, a large family in it. And uh, it was then that uh, I just was kind of overtaken by fear. And uh, I froze. I, mean, I, re I remained motionless for an hour and a half. John never knew anyone made it until about 10 years ago when crash survivors invited him to go hike back up to that site. So he did. Um, I guess it completed my connection to the community. Hmm. And didn't feel so alone in the grief. Not that long after that hike, he sought counseling. It really helped him with his grief. Later in life, he ended up being a paramedic and firefighter. And to this day, he serves as a part of the Alpine Rescue Team. When we return, a look at the site where people have gathered to remember. A peek at a new tribute on the Wichita State campus. This is Memorial 70. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. I don't think uh, much more than a day or two will go by, but what I don't think of some one of them uh, that perished in the in the crash. Another example of their commitment uh, to, to show the community that that a, a historical event that doesn't define the university but certainly is part of its history. Where have all the young girls gone? People will remember uh, because the memories are vivid yet today after 50 years. After a year, on this day, October 2nd, the community comes together to pay their respects to those who passed away in 1970. By fall 1971, Memorial 70 was erected on the southwest side of campus. It's a place where you can see the names of those who passed. Now, people can see a new WSU Survivors Monument, recognizing those who survived the plane crash. People who, to this day, come back to those who are no longer here. Running back Marvin Brown Jr. graduated from Solomon High School. He was majoring in physical education. Junior defensive back Donald Christian was from Duncan, Oklahoma. One of his best friends survived the impact of the crash. Sophomore quarterback John Duran came from Oklahoma City. He was bumped up as a starter the week before. The same went for Tom Shedden, a Putnam City, Oklahoma graduate. He was an offensive lineman. Born in McPherson, Ronnie Johnson was a senior defensive back. He had many talents, including playing basketball and music. He was engaged to be married. Junior defensive back Randy Keesaw comes from Clinton, Oklahoma. He went to WSU to study business. Just that summer, Mal Kimmel got married to his high school sweetheart. A week before the crash, she found out she was pregnant. Mal earned a starter spot days before the trip. Tackle Carl Kruger came from Chicago. He was a sophomore and loved the Midwest, music, and motorcycles. He was just promoted to starting guard. Senior linebacker Steve Moore was from Derby. He was a proud Panther and a man of faith. Derby High School recently inducted him into its Hall of Fame. Junior running back Tom Owen Jr. was from Temple Terrace, Florida. He played basketball, baseball, and ran track in high school. Gene Robinson was from Dayton, Ohio. He was a junior end. Gene had a wife, Hattie Jean, and two sons, Derek and David. Rick Steins was a guard from Kansas City. He graduated from Washington High School. John Taylor was a senior cornerback. He was a football star from Sherman, Texas. He initially survived the crash, and hospital staff said he was so brave, but he died later that month. Jack Vetter Jr. was a senior tackle from McPherson. 
A survivor tried to save him, but Jack told him to get out so he wouldn't get trapped in the aircraft on fire. Marty Harrison was a manager for the Shocks. He was weeks away from celebrating his 20th birthday. Shocker Club Chair Ray Coleman passed away along with his wife Maxine. They were active in the community and church. She worked at Boeing for 21 years. Carl Farbach served in the U.S. Army during World War II. He was awarded a Purple Heart. He was Dean of Admissions. He left behind two children, David and Patricia. His late wife, Ruth, had helped organize memorial ceremonies at WSU. Associate Athletic Director and Ticket Manager Floyd Farmer was a track athlete in high school and college and majored in education. He left behind a wife, Sharon, and two children, Eric and Dana. John Bud Grooms was the vice president of Boulevard State Bank. He was also a huge Shocker fan who won a trip with the team. He and his wife, Etta Mae, left behind two children, Eric and Nancy. Known as Mr. Shocker, Burt Katzemeyer was the athletic director. He was instrumental to get funds to build Cessna Stadium. He and his wife, Marion, left behind two daughters, Kay and Anne. State Representative Ray King and his wife, Yvonne, were anxious to see old friends and watch the Shockers play. The tragedy left their seven children orphan, but Mary Lynn, Gary, Terry, Lori, Lisa, Julie, and Dina were comforted by support in their hometown of Heston. Tom Reeves was the team trainer. After the crash, he was able to rescue a few of the football players. However, he died days later. He was a WSU alum and Concordia native. He left behind a wife and two sons. Ben Wilson was the head football coach. He was a high school coaching legend in Ohio. His wife, Helen, was a Girl Scout leader. They left behind their kids, Elizabeth and John. Flight attendant Judy Dunn was an Oklahoma City school teacher and mother of three. She was 39 years old. Judy Lane was also a flight attendant on board. She was from Oklahoma City. She was 28. Also from OKC was the pilot, Dan Crocker. He passed away at 27. On behalf of our Cake News family, we want to say thank you to the survivors and also the family members of people who are no longer with us. Though Wichita State football is no longer played on the heart of this field, the program is certainly in our hearts.